in series. My name is Rebecca Harrison and I'm the manager of adult services here at Central Library. We will be recording this presentation, which will start right now. Um, I'm very excited to be here as part of this fall series. I'm in charge of introducing our speakers and sort of facilitating the Q&A and it's, it's been a great time so far. I wanted to say thank you, of course, to the Friends of the Tulsa City County Libraries for sponsoring today's program. If you'd like more information about how to become a friend of the library, simply visit tulsalibrary.org slash friends. If you have any questions throughout today's program, please feel free to put those in the chat. Our speaker will be answering audience questions following his presentation today. I'd like to welcome Sloan Davis, who will be presenting on News of the World by Paulette Giles. Sloan is an associate professor of English at Tulsa Community College. He received his BA in English from the State University of New York at Albany, an MA in literature from the University of Tulsa, where he was a Perriott fellow, and an MFA in creative writing from Wichita State, where he received an MFA fellow in fiction. Along with a partner, he writes and produces films. Their latest project, Lonely Hunter, the first of a series of short films, was showcased recently in the Red Dirt Film Festival and the 74th University Film and Video Conference. Sloan also writes and performs stories. He has performed live at OKSO of Tulsa numerous times, and he has had fiction and poetry published in Barnstorm, the Wisconsin Review, Nebo, the Tulsa Review, the Aristook Review, and other literary journals. He is a singer-songwriter for the band Your Drunken Uncle. He travels often and gives tours of Ireland. Please join me in warmly welcoming Sloan Davis. Hi. 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 Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, okay. Well, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Rebecca, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I guess, do we just jump right in to the presentation, correct? Yep. You're good to go. Excellent. So I'm going to, I have a, thank you. I have a PowerPoint I'm going to share, um, and then we will get started here. Okay, I hope everyone can see this. Let's see if I can get it to work in slide form. There we go. Okay, News of the World by Paulette Giles. Uh, what a fun read. Uh, I had a very good time reading this. Um, an easy, uh, approachable read. Um, beautifully written, uh, passages that I read more than once because of the writing. And um, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it took my mind away from all the troubles that we're facing in the world today. And, and even though there's a lot of troubles for the characters in here, um, they weren't mine. So I enjoyed reading them. Uh, so let's get into this. Uh, Paulette Giles, uh, here's a little bio that I found of hers. Uh, she's 77 years old. She, um, she was born uh, in Salem, Missouri, and she's, she has a BA in, uh, uh, in education, but she is a, a vast reader and, and a very smart woman. Uh, she's had a very interesting life. She lived in Canada. Um, she worked with the uh, native populations up in the, like northern Ontario for years. It was very poor during those years, but she was also writing poetry. Um, and you can find a lot of this on her um, website, her own personal website as well. Uh, and so she writes a lot about those in memoirs and also in some of her poems. Um, she did transition at one point to fiction and, and I sort of built her literary identity um, mainly in fiction, probably since the early 90s. Uh, and then, you know, she, in, in her memoir, she, she writes about... Uh, meeting her ex-husband uh, who um, sort of brought her to San Antonio where she lives now and lives on a ranch. And um, from my understanding, from the readings that I've read and interviews with her is that she's, she's uh, can be a bit cantankerous. Uh, she's a bit tough, uh, but she's extremely well-read and smart and expects other people to be so. So uh, maybe it's forgivable. Um, okay. So a little bit about her, and I'm, I'm hoping to share this. I know this is being recorded, but um, if I can get this uh, PowerPoint to uh, um, anyone who's in charge of this, they can share it with whoever wishes to have it. Um, so here's her bibliography and awards. As you can see, she's, she was published first with poetry in 1973. Um, and as she goes along here, you see that she, she has written a children's book, 
uh, poems, of course, and then memoirs, a couple of them, as well as the ones that aren't selected or sorry, aren't put in the parenthetical about fiction. They are fiction. Um, and News of the World came out in 2016. It's now being made into a movie uh, starring Tom Hanks. It comes out this Christmas. Um, and then she just uh, published Simon the Fiddler, uh, who's a character in News of the World. And that just came out recently. And we'll talk about that more as we go along. But first, I'd like you to hear from the author. I, I found this little clip, and it's wonderfully connected to the libraries. Uh, and so you can hear her voice and hear her appreciation of librarians and libraries. And uh, it's focused on her, um, her book, News of the World. So I'm going to play this. I hope it works. Hi, I'm Paula Job, and I really want to thank librarians for supporting this book. And I thank you for being in the library. And so many libraries are volunteer. Thank you to the volunteers, especially in our little community. And um, librarians are really important. They've always been important to me. And so thank you. My mother was a great seamstress, and she loved to sew clothing for us kids. And she sewed me a pair of little pajamas, and they were so cute. They're summer pajamas. They stopped at the knee, and they had a little shirt with them, and they had really pretty stripes. And I jumped out of bed one morning. I was so anxious to go to the library. This is the truth. I forgot to get dressed, and I wore my pajamas down to the library. But they were so cute, nobody noticed. And when I... <laughs> it's like one of those horrible nightmares when you realize you don't have any clothes on and you're in a public place. And I think I was in third grade and I was sitting there, oh, I thought, oh my God, I've got my pajamas on. And, and so I jumped up and ran home and I was crying. My mother said, they're cute, nobody could tell. <laughs> so that's how I anxious I was to get to the library. Okay, I, I share that with you. Uh, um, um, it shows her appreciation for reading and, and libraries and and it's not really stated so but I think it's true and that is uh, she has a certain education from going to the library from reading uh, and this reminds me of the science fiction writer Ray Bradbury who often said uh, that he was educated in libraries uh, he didn't go to a form he didn't get a formal uh, education uh, outside of high school and so he would go to the libraries and read. Um, so I just thought that was very timely and uh, wonderfully said on her part. Okay, so I have a summary here. I don't know uh, how many viewers have actually read the book News of the World. Um, those who have, this is not new information, uh, but those who, might, who haven't read it and might be interested, I thought I would share my summary. And so I'll read this. Uh, News of the World is the story of an elderly man and a young orphan girl who find themselves on a dangerous journey in 1870 Texas. Captain Jefferson Kyle Kidd makes a living reading the news aloud to curious onlookers at a dime per head. Johanna, 10 years old or so, recently freed from a Kiowa tribe, does not remember English or hardly any time before her family was killed by that same tribe. Captain Kidd finds himself with the daunting task of taking Johanna back to her relatives. Problem is, they must go from Wichita, Wichita Falls to Castroville, just outside of San Antonio hundreds of miles in an excursion wagon pulled by one horse. In the years following the Civil War and during the time of the Indian Wars, Texas truly was a land of outlaws and lawlessness. Their journey will be long with threats coming from desperados and warring factions, let alone the foreboding landscape and weather. However, like any compelling journey, we see the external ex existential drama as it is played out, but we also witness the closer drama built from the tension between these two strong-headed characters. All the while, we see their internal battles, beliefs, fears, struggles, and eventual change. Oh, sorry, folks, I went too fast. Current slide, there we go. So I broke this uh, presentation down into these sort of uh, main ideas, characters, landscape, history, news, and captives. Um, I think not, not so much thematically, although themes obviously connect to them, but more about basically the interest in this novel. Um, I consider this a, a historical novel, a historical fiction, uh, Western, of course, but, but I do believe it's a historical uh, work of, of writing because she's true to the time period. Uh, I've written here, News of the World is a historical Western 
The setting and time are accurately portrayed. This is very true. Uh, described and explained. Giles clearly did a great amount of research and it shows. She also details her research in an essay added to the back of the novel entitled Essay on Research. I don't know if you have this version, um, uh, but it's actually very interesting to read for me. Uh, I like to study writers' process and, and what they go through. Uh, further, as a poet, her use of language often creates a lyrical tone, even with the clip stark narrative style she employs for the novel. News of the World is a fun and trancing read because of the combination of these elements, but more importantly, due to Giles's execution of those elements. And I'm going to share some uh, passages with you uh, from her writing, and let's uh, get into some of these details. Here is uh, some of the main characters, or, or I guess some of these might be secondary characters as well, but um, I didn't list them all. Uh, but of course, the main two is our Captain Jefferson Kyle Kidd and Johanna. Uh, Captain Jefferson Kyle Kidd is a classic Western uh, hero uh, character, you know, the good guy. Uh, he has a very interesting backstory. He's been, he's 71 going on 72 in this narrative. Uh, and so he was basically born at the turn of the century uh, and had witnessed the, the um, evolution of a very early America, right? Uh, he himself has been through many wars. Um, I think I have that um, written down here. He, um, at 16, he started uh, his first foray into, uh, into war, and it was the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in Alabama. Uh, where he first gets uh, his experience. He's soon a sergeant through various um, um, events and then eventually gets the title captain. Um, he's, a, he's a very, he's tall, he's got a great voice and he's a very strong character. Um, you know, I read somewhere that uh, Giles talks about inner drive of characters and how important it is uh, to her uh, creating these characters. And, and uh, he certainly has an inner drive. Um, at 71, going on 72, uh, what he goes through physically in this novel is quite impressive. Um, uh, he's a great shot. He just has all these tropes of the great Western. And I love that she, uh, you know, made him an elderly character in this regard, right? So he's not a young 35-year-old um, he is, he has experienced a lot, he's witnessed a lot, and it's his backstory that often reveals some of American history as well. Uh, Johanna is um, a captive. She uh, was captive when she was around six by the Kiowa tribe that killed her family. Um, this is a very fascinating part of the novel. It's a very fascinating part of American history because this occurred quite often uh, during this time. And uh, the psychology behind it is fascinating because a lot of times these captives uh, do not want to or, or want to go back and stay with the, uh, the Indian tribes that, that took them. Uh, but uh, for her individual self, she's, a, she's also a very strong uh, 10, 11 year old. Uh, she knows a lot about the world. She, uh, uh, she's uh, smart when they, when they get into battles. She's very uh, decisive. Uh, inventive, uh, but she's also very stubborn. And uh, there's an internal struggle between these two um, that is wonderfully played out as they journey down this road. Uh, Britt Johnson is a freed uh, black man. Um, and it's a very interesting element in that 1870 Texas, you know, right after the Civil War, there was reconstruction is, is starting. Um, there's a lot of unknowns at this time about what America will become um, and, and how things will be played out. And so his character sort of shows that aspect. Uh, and it's interesting how he, he, he kind of ref hopes that Captain Kidd will take Johanna off of him because uh, it's a dangerous journey for a, a, an African-American at that time. Uh, Simon Bowdlin, I think I'm saying that correct, is the fiddler and friend of Captain Kidd. Um, he plays sort of a pivotal role, a uh, short couple chapters with his uh, long love, Doris Dillon, who's an Irish American. Uh, and they do play some significant roles in this uh, that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, All May is uh, a great dark character uh, and very dark uh, in a lot of ways. Of, uh, he's after Johanna 
um, and, and following them earlier on in the novel. Uh, Mrs. Gannett is a wonderful love interest for Captain Kidd or possible love, love interest. Um, and uh, she plays a great role in uh, working with Johanna, but also, uh, I don't know, I just found it uh, touching that Captain Kidd and, and Miss, Mrs. Gannett had this uh, connection. Uh, John Talley uh, plays uh, a character trying to figure out his identity in this post-Civil War era. Um, you know, there are allegiances to different f political factions um, in Texas at the time, and he's just trying to keep his small town um, from being uh, railroaded as it is. Uh, and then Wilhelm and Anna Leenberger are uh, Johanna's distant relatives, and uh, and they, they, they have an interesting role at the end. They're very um, a matter of fact. They're very dry and, and they just sort of work, if you will. Adolf is a, a friend of theirs uh, who has a kind heart and is worried for Johanna's sake. I'm trying not to give too much away because of spoiler alert. So uh, that's just an overview of some of the main characters. Captain Kidd also has children that, that uh, play a role and a, and a, a uh, he's also a widower. His wife died, and her uh, inheritance and background are important to the novel as well. Um, what you see here are um, two photos. Uh, these are the I took this directly from the book. This is the map, and they did a wonderful job of showing us the the road, the trail that Captain Kidd and Johanna had to take. Um, this is over two hundred miles. I don't know the exact miles, but it would have been you know, taking a long time in 1870 um, in an excursion wagon, you know, one of those wagons that has the tarps and there's the seats facing each other inside um, and one horse pulling it one tied to the back. So they're almost like limping down this road, if you will. And then this photo down here uh, is a painting of the Indian Wars. And the reason I posted it there is because this is sort of the landscape. This is the historical moment that Captain Kidd and Johanna have to maneuver through uh, to try to get her to her relatives in Castroville. Um, and I found it very fascinating. And I also, just a little side note, love the details here of how they put this, looks like an old timey uh, flyer. Um, so it shows the map there. Okay. So um, let me see, let me just check something here. Da, 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 da. Oh, one thing that kept coming up to me um, was that this was 150 years ago, basically, right? Exactly. Uh, that's when it was set. And I, and I find it so fascinating on many levels. Uh, first of all, here they are in Wichita Falls and going to Castroville, which is just outside of San Antonio. I don't know. That's probably a couple hours in a car, maybe three hours. Um, and it, took, it takes them weeks. Um, just the difference of where we are in 2020 compared to where they are in 1870. Uh, on many levels. I'm going to talk about this when it comes to the news, uh, America as a country at that time. Uh, it's fascinating that in 150 years, we can move so fast. We can progress so fast as a culture, both on the technological level, um, but also in, in our country's identity. So more on setting. Um, I have this little uh, equation here that I share with my, uh, my creative writing students. Time plus location equals atmosphere. And it's, it's, it's very stripped down, basic uh, uh, formula. But it actually works for a lot of times. And, and that's what uh, Giles creates. Uh, she writes at the end of the book in this essay uh, on research, she says, as for the landscape of North Texas, I had already explored the remains of Spanish Fort for the color of lightning. It's on the Red River. There is nothing like being there, among, walking among the old foundations and visiting the graveyard on a rise just outside Spanish Fort, overlooking the Red. It is beautiful country, and the water of the river is really very red. And there's a photo of it there on the right. Uh, Mrs. Giles, so I'm sorry, this is from the New York Times. Mrs. Giles writes books that bring the natural world to life and are also agonizingly eventful. Uh, furthermore, uh, in the Washington um, Review of Books, it, it says, uh, Giles' descriptive powers are as mighty as the land she paints. The author is an accomplished poet, as her lyrical language attests on every page. And the reason that I, I put this all on one slide here is to discuss this idea of setting 
and how important it is to the novel, but also her use of, of language in the novel. And she ties those together. Um, and I think at times she does a wonderful job of um, not falling into classic tropes of the Western. So there's many options for her to choose, obviously. Um, and it would be very easy for her to choose something uh, that would just be like a gun battle. And then there are, there is a gun fight in this book, but she doesn't like fall on that constantly like a Clint Eastwood Western, you know, that's, that's her common trope to go to. Um, and I wanted to read uh, on page 172 to 173. So if you have the book, uh, please open it and follow along. Uh, this might take a minute, but I really think this is, this encapsulates uh, both her writing of, of, uh, her use of language and her research of the landscape and the time and, and everything sort of intermixing at this one moment. Uh, I will start at the sort of the top of 172. Raiding parties of young men had their own laws and their own universe in which the niceties of civilized warfare did not count. And an old man and a young girl were fair game to them. For in the Indian wars, there were no civilians. After a while, the captain and Johanna went to sit in the spring house and listen to the soft clatter of running water. In the shadows, they could keep watch and perhaps sleep a little. The running water was soothing and sweet. Two great live oaks overhung the stream from above. They dropped their leaves one at a time into the water. The new leaves were coming in and pushing off the old ones slowly, slowly. They were small and hard. They fell like pennies. And looking out of the spring house window, he saw one of the great drooping limbs overhead begin to shake. Its farthing leaves came down in a light shower. He drew in his breath in a small sound. He thought at first the enormous live oak was at last coming loose from its tenuous hold on the bank overhead and would fall. He had seen it happen once before. The girl woke up and came to stand beside him in the shadow and look through the minute window. Out of the broad, out of the broad limbs, a figure dropped. It was so startling that it seemed to take forever. A slim young man with long blonde hair fell and fell. He held his bow and quiver overhead with one hand. The moon shone on him as he fell. His hair flowed up over his head like spun flax a cloud of gold. It was cut short on one side, Kiowa. He struck the water and fine or thin fans like crystal erupted around him. He then surfaced and skimmed through the water to the bank. He held his weapons over his head. Captain Kidd turned his hand with the revolver in it so that the barrel pointed out. The water reflections made deep blue planes under his eyes. He wondered if she would betray him, if she would call out to the young captive and his fellows who hid above on the bluff somewhere. If this was his last night on earth, this was what she had wanted so much to return to the Kiowa and the life she had known, the people whom she considered her people and their gods, her gods. <clears throat> the rest of it's quite beautiful as well in that passage, uh, but I'll stop there. And what I wanted to point out was, A, it's just beautifully constructed, beautiful language. Uh, it captures the silence of that moment. Um, it, it was a scene that I read numerous times because I kept thinking, the first time I read it, I was like, well, shouldn't there be conflict here? Shouldn't there be uh, up them, up against these Kiowa uh, tribe members and there should be a battle and they should barely escape? And then I realized, thinking this over, it's like, no, that would be a lesser writer's approach. Uh, her approach is to capture the silent beauty of the Kiowa and how they interact with nature and their reaction to it. Um, you know, a lesser writer might have had Johanna try to uh, call out to them and there's a gun battle and he barely grabs her and escapes. Instead, she just puts her hand on his and nods and they have this, uh, you get their view in this most lyrical, uh, poetic moment in that scene. It's one of the I think one of the most beautiful scenes in the book. Uh, so I just wanted to show her masterful touch of writing in that scene. Um, so we're gonna shift to captives. 
this too is also on the left here. A note from the author is taken directly from the book. I just took a photo off my phone. Um, and again, she gives so much information that you can do further research about. I actually really found the captives fascinating on a psychological uh, level, right? She says, anyone interested in the psychology of children captured and adopted by Native American tribes on the frontier should read Scott, Scott Zeck's book, The Captured. And she talks about that, uh, about how, you know, that helped her in her research and everything. And she says at the end, um, they apparently became Indian in every way, these are the captives, and rarely readjusted when returned to their non-Native families. They always wished to return to their adoptive families, even when they had been with their Indian families for less than a year. That is stunning uh, information there. This was true for both the Anglo, German Anglo and Mexican children taken. I think the words of my Irish character, Doris Dillon, best expressed it. I'll let you find her words in the story. Uh, and I will read that to you uh, to show that expression. But I, I do have this quote here on the, on the, sorry, on the right side here. It says, and this is from Captain Kidd's perspective. As Doris had said back in the Spanish fort, all those captured as children and returned were restless and hungry for some spiritual solace, abandoned by two cultures, dark shooting stars, lost in the outer heavens. Again, beautiful lyrical writing, um, but also kind of touching on this identity crisis of, of what it must be to be a captive. Uh, but to get to uh, Giles's point about Doris Dillon's uh, expressing it, I'll turn to page 56 to just quickly read that. Um, so I'm in the middle of the page on 56. This is uh, Doris. She said, to go through our first creation is a turning of the soul. We hope toward the light out of the animal world. God be with us to go through another tears all the making of the first creation and sometimes it falls to bits. This is the process of being captive. We fall into pieces. She is asking, where is that rock of my creation? The captain took out shaving gear. He went to the far side and hung his mirror on a bolt end and shaved. He said, Miss Dillon, you know this how. On Gorta Moor, she said, which is the great famine, the great potato famine. In the famine, children saw their parents die and then went to live with the people on the other side. In their minds, they went. When they came back, they were unfinished. They are forever falling. And I just found that, again, beautifully stated um, by Giles, uh, that she sort of, and no, I guess pun intended, captures uh, what it must be like to be a captive, uh, this identity crisis that happens with the captives. Uh, for me, you know, I've, I've known about the captives in, in, of course, in previous studies of, of history, but, but it, it really just kind of opens it up from my mind here as, as an, you know, an image and a process uh, that I think Giles did a fantastic job. And now I'm curious, now I want to know more. Uh, and then this is Kiowa Dutch. Uh, she mentions this in her essay on research. It was there, the Smithsonian, that I found a, a photo of Kiowa Dutch, a mysterious person who was clearly Caucasian but had been raised Kiowa and had no knowledge of his original name or birthplace or provenance. I just found this uh, picture uh, stunning and, uh, and it captures her research of what, you know, the powerful research that she does uh, for her novel. All right, so finally to news and storytelling, which is um, the core of this book in a lot of ways. Um, as mentioned, Kyle, uh, Captain Kidd, uh, and maybe I didn't mention this, I, I hope I did. Uh, he, tell, he reads the news, that's his job. He goes around um, from town to town and reads newspapers to uh, locals. And um, he's a very good news, uh, sorry, storyteller. And uh, he, gets, he gets to travel around, see the world um, as a widower. You know, his children have moved to Georgia, um, so he's on his own. Um, I say here, storytelling is a motif and theme that runs throughout the novel. We get backstory on the characters, on historical events that shape the United States, and of course, through various newspapers that Captain Kidd reads 
Um, the novel opens on Captain Kidd reading from the Boston Morning Journal about the 15th Amendment, which is the, the um, uh, amendment that uh, allows all, all men to vote, no matter of their background. Uh, and, in, and he says, and, and there's this great voice, right, of Captain Kidd. Uh, he says, that means colored gentlemen. That means colored gentlemen, he said. Let us have no vaporings or girlish shrieks, right? So he's trying to explain the 15th Amendment to this group, uh, but he also knows how to read the room. Uh, Captain Kidd is himself a source of information. He acts like today's news broadcast or social media that we have for a time when news from faraway places rarely reached the frontiers of the Wild West. Because of this, there is a certain fascination, magic uh, to his delivery of the news. He also knows how to read, to perform for his particular audience. As I said, he reads the room well. Um, again, this is fascinating for me because 150 years ago, this is the vehicle for news, right? Now, you know, click on your phone, boom, you can access anything going on anywhere in the world. Uh, it's a, a fascinating uh, element for me. Uh, what a wonderful time she must have had writing about this. Uh, imagining this elderly man, you know, traveling through Texas and telling stories and uh, reading from the newspapers. Um, I am going to read one more time, if I have time. Um, really quick, page uh, 60. Um, and this really captures, I think, the beauty, again, of Giles's fascination with this idea of reading the newspapers, but also it captures uh, uh, Captain Kidd. And now we took them away to far places and strange peoples into mythic forms of thought and the structures of fairy tales. He read from the Philadelphia Inquirer of Dr. Schleiman's search for windy Troy somewhere in Turkey. He read of the telegraph wires successfully laid from Britain to India, an article in the Calcutta Times forwarded to the London Daily Telegraph, a technological advance that seemed almost otherworldly. Uh, as he glanced up, it seemed to the captain that he saw the blonde man again, or at least the glint of ash blonde hair just at the borders of his light. This went into his mind and then out of his mind as he grappled with the big four sheets of the Boston Daily Journal. To finish, he read the unfortunate Hansa crushed in the pack ice in its attempt on the North Pole, the survivors rescued by a whaler. This was proving the most popular as he could see by the small gestures of the audience, they bent forward, they fixed their eyes upon him to hear of undiscovered lands in the kingdoms of ice, fabulous beasts, perils overcome, snowy people in furry suits. Uh, I find that just wonderfully written again, lyrical, um, and also captures this idea of news and uh, it being a source of entertainment and, and uh, wonder. I know I'm going to speed up here. Um, I finally just listed some themes here uh, that I, I felt were in the novel. Um, identity being top of the list for me. Uh, this is both identity crisis and Johanna, uh, self and family identity, but also uh, the American identity as a country. Um, the role of family, individuality, uh, nomadic versus settled. I mean, all this is being played out right in Texas at that time, both uh, for the Native Americans, uh, but also for uh, Captain Kidd himself, who's nomadic, uh, to America. Uh, what, what would America become uh, and Texas become at this time? And then there's uh, obviously some other themes here that I won't go into, but I think that they're very important to the novel. My last thing is the denouement. Um, if I have one criticism, it is of the denouement. She, she tries this... Um, sort of epic approach, Dixon, Dickens, sorry, uh, epic approach where she tries to wrap up all parties, all events into this sort of one last paragraph, or sorry, chapter of exposition. And it just felt like it is a different kind of writing style attached to her beautiful, lyrical, but stark narrative. Um, and I'm not the only one that thinks that. Uh, it's also part of Kwiatnowski's um, review in the Washington Independent Review of Books. Uh, she feels the same way. Um, I'll let you guys read that on your own because I want to give time to questions. This is her last book, latest book, Simon the Fiddler. So if you like News of the World, um, please uh, pick that up. Okay.
Did I do well with time? Uh, yeah, you did great. We have about five minutes left for any okay. questions um, in the chat. I don't know if you've had a chance to glance at that, but there are lots of positive comments about your presentation. Oh, great. I'm sorry um, if I was rushed. I, I, I need two hours. <laughs> well, I thought it felt very measured, so no stress there. Let's see. So we did have a question, and you did touch on this at the end, but maybe you have another answer as well. Someone wants to know if there were any scenes in the book that you thought were unrealistic. Yeah, um, I actually made note of that. Um, you know, I was I was reading and taking notes all the time, often about the details. But there is the great battle scene in this novel. There's one sort of battle scene, and and it's a fun battle, and it and it's a very classic Western idea. And I think she has to have it, um, of course. But it felt a little unrealistic. I don't want to go into details, but there's a moment with dimes and a shotgun and. Uh, it felt a little too much fun, maybe. I kind of felt myself slipping out of the narrative a little bit going, is, is this realistic? Um, there's moments where they, the, the, the action slows down a little too much for me and, it, and it's like Captain Kidd is having too much time to think about his thoughts. Um, so there are moments, there are moments that felt a little, um, I guess, unreal. Uh, but like that, that, that part I read about the Kiowa dropping out of the trees, uh, that felt, stunningly beautiful and real in the silence of witnessing that and that put me further into the novel so I can forgive those moments where she jumps on those western tropes a little too much well the person who asked the question said they were actually thinking of that scene when they asked the question so. <laughs> well good, good. Great, great minds say. great minds think alike um, someone else in that chat wants to know what you think of Tom Hanks being cast as Captain Kidd. Does he fit your vision for the character? And I love Tom Hanks. I no, Tom Hanks, and I love Tom Hanks. I think he's a great actor, and he can travel many characters. Uh, first of all, if you've seen the trailer of this, if you read the book and, and you watched the trailer, they are changing this drastically. Uh, and uh, in a lot of ways, uh, which they do sometimes in films. It's hard for me to swallow sometimes, um, but good question. I think, I think Tom Hanks is gonna pull it off because he's a great actor. I just saw uh, a different character in my mind. Um, uh, who could play him? I would have to give some thought to that. Uh, Sam, uh, what's his last name? Uh, Elliot would be a great character maybe uh, as Captain Kidd. Um, so yes, that's my answer. Okay. Um, somebody wants to know, uh, how did Johanna wind up back with the white people? Oh yeah, that's a good question. And I, I should have probably put that in the summary. Um, she is rescued, uh, by Brit. Uh, Brit has, um, received a $50, uh, dollar gold piece, uh, to rescue her. And he has had experience in doing so because his own son, was stolen by the Kiowa tribe. And he had gone out, they don't really give us details, Giles doesn't give us the details of that, but he goes out and uh, rescues his own son, so he has experience. So then he rescues Johanna, and then he's, you know, he uh, elicits Captain Kidd to take over from there and gives him the gold piece uh, because he doesn't want anything to do with going through certain territories of Texas. It'd be very dangerous for him. Okay, we have a question about how the character got the newspapers from Boston and other places. Yeah, uh, so they don't really tell you that right away. He's got a, he's got a portfolio he keeps and it's very uh, safe and wrapped up throughout the book. And, uh, uh, you know, it, and, and, and as they're going along this journey, by the way, and I should have mentioned this, he is pulling in because they need money. So he pulls into these small towns and he still reads the newspapers to these various uh, small communities. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a motif that works its way through the entire novel. Um, he gets them uh, from the larger cities, from Dallas, uh, San Antonio, um, and he sees his own end sort of coming as well. So he loads them up and then he goes out to these outpost communities, if you will, and reads them uh, and performs <laughs> in this, and he's got this great voice supposedly, and he performs um, the, the news for them. Uh, but he also sees that this is going to be an this is going to end soon because the telegraph and things are coming. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, how are the indigenous portrayed in the book? Stereotypically nuanced. 
I'm, I'm sorry, you broke up. What was the question? Uh, how are the indigenous characters portrayed in the book? Is it stereotypical or nuanced? I, I would say uh, they're not a major character in this book. Uh, so they are sort of spoken about from a distance. You do see them at one point. A beautiful described scene across the Red River that's over flooding and uh, causing all kinds of chaos. And Johanna is on this rock and she's shouting to her Kiowa people and they are passing by. Uh, and, and that's one thing that I love about this novel too, is you constantly see this movement of people uh, at this time, right? Oklahoma wasn't uh, just Indian territory. Uh, New Mexico was still a territory. So, uh, so it's just very nomadic and, and interesting. And I thought, you know, I would say nuance to a certain degree. Um, they, they don't really, there's no major character to really get deep into nuance when it comes to the Kiowa or the Native American characters. Okay, so I think we may have time for one last question. Somebody wants to know if you've read any other books by Giles and do you have any comments about those if so? Okay, no, <laughs> that's the truth. I, this is my first time and I'm going to read more because, uh, and I'm not a huge fan of the Western in the sense I, I did when I was younger, but you know how like horror movies or certain genres uh, you run up against the same uh, tropes and the same ideas. And so for me, they get a little taxing, they get a little, you know, uh, worn out. And, and, but I find her approach uh, as a poet beautiful. I just, I, I, I think she does things that, I, like I said, she captures uh, silence instead of falling into making a big battle scene. Uh, it's very fresh, very, um, um, different and rewarding in that regard. So yeah, no, I am going to read more. Uh, uh, the Simon the Fiddler seems interesting to me because he was an interesting character. Uh, and Doris Dillon, I'm a big Irish fan, so she's in that book. So I want to read more about their romance. Um, and so I would just say this, uh, you know, her writing is sort of fresh in the sense of it's remaking the Western uh, in a lot of ways, because uh, that's what has to happen now. Uh, we can't be writing, you know, Lonesome Dove or True Grit, those are beautiful stories, but they were of their time. And so like now you see things like uh, the Coen brothers doing the ballad of uh, Buster Scruggs, uh, remaking of the Western in these different uh, forms. And I, I would say that even though she follows the, the genre well, she is remaking it in her style and in, in her tone and poetry. Very cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I think I can speak for our, everyone in attendance. It was a fascinating talk and you're a great speaker. Oh, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you very much for joining us. And for everyone in attendance, be sure to join us next week. We'll be chatting with Diane Potts, PhD, Professor of Human mm -hmm. Services at Tulsa Community College. She'll be discussing two books by Lisa Wingate. And you can email friends at tulsalibrary.org to get the Zoom link for that. And I hope everyone has a lovely week and enjoys this fall weather. And thank you again, Sloan. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Great. I enjoyed it. Same. Bye-bye.